Quality control is a process of inspecting and testing equipment on a regular basis to ensure it is functioning safely and as intended. In CT scanning, this can mean ensuring image quality is of high standard and that radiation doses are appropriate and just that we're operating to a high standard overall. The QC role of any technologist operating a CT scanner should include a brief environmental inspection at least once a week to ensure everything is clean, nothing's damaged, and everything in the CT suite is in order. Daily roles for the technologist include a tube warm-up to maintain the life of the tube and daily air calibrations. Air calibrations are generally run by an automated scan with nothing but empty air inside the gantry. This usually takes about 10 minutes and during this time, the scanner will take several exposures at specified technical factors and assess how much radiation is reaching the detectors to calibrate its zero values and make sure that everything is working as it should. These items are straightforward parts of a QC program and will be routinely performed by any technologist. Now we'll move on to the more involved QC tests, some of which may be performed by a dedicated QC tech. I'll be describing some of the limits and values which apply to these tests, and all of these numbers come from the Canadian standards laid out by Safety Code 35. I encourage you to look directly at the appropriate reference material to learn the relevant standards as necessary. Many QC tests are going to be performed with an acrylic phantom or a water phantom. As we know, the CT number of water is zero Hansfield units, so one of the most basic QC tests will do is to test the CT number accuracy by scanning the water phantom and assessing how close to zero that number is in the middle of the phantom. The CT number for water should vary from zero by no more than plus or minus four Hounsfield units. When scanning this plain water phantom, we can also assess cross-field uniformity and noise in a CT image. Cross-field uniformity is an assessment of whether the CT number of a homogeneous material like water is measured the same at the center as it is at the periphery of the phantom. And in CT, it's measured by placing one region of interest, or ROI, at the center of the phantom, and then four ROIs around the edges of the phantom. The difference between the center and any of the peripheral measurements should not vary significantly from the baseline amount of variation established for each scanner. And we'll see a few QC tests like this where the standards are laid out in safety code 35, but rather than being absolute limits, they're set relative to baseline limits measured for each particular scanner. The final test we can easily do with the water phantom is to assess for noise. Noise is assessed by taking a large ROI occupying at least 40% of the size of the phantom and assessing the standard deviation within that area. We know we have a homogeneous phantom, so any deviation in measured values in that area is noise. And as with uniformity, the standards for noise are set relative to the scanner's baseline values. These three tests assessing the CT number accuracy, noise, and uniformity on a water phantom should be performed weekly. CT number linearity refers to the response in measured CT numbers to changes in the type of material or tissue being scanned. A phantom with areas of various density simulating air, fat, water, soft tissue, and bone is scanned, and then the measured Hounsfield units are assessed and compared to the values they should actually represent based on their known linear attenuation coefficients. This allows us to assess if the scanner is properly detecting changes across a range of densities. That is, if we increase the absorptive properties across different types of tissues in a linear fashion, does the measured Hounsfield units properly respond in a linear fashion? CT number linearity should be tested monthly. Slice thickness can be measured by using a phantom with lines spaced at set intervals along the z-axis. So the phantom itself looks like this, and if you were to look at this area from the side, these lines diverge along the length of the z-axis, so we can count the number of lines and assess how thick our slice is. The accuracy of the slice thickness relative to the selected value is dependent on the detector element size and the size of the focal spot in the tube. Slice thickness should be assessed monthly. Also shown on this phantom, we have the spatial resolution test with these sets of lines in the center which gets closer and closer together. Spatial resolution is the ability to resolve between two different objects which are close together in physical space, like these adjacent light and dark lines. In CT, spatial resolution is described in terms of line pairs per centimeter. Besides assessing spatial resolution with this phantom, 
We can also use the modulation transfer function or MTF, which is a mathematical description of the spatial resolution limits of the scanner. Spatial resolution should be tested quarterly. Next up, we have contrast resolution. And contrast resolution is the ability to resolve between two objects which only have a slight difference in density. So this phantom has several regions with a spectrum of similar densities in it, or several regions of decreasing size with densities very close to the density of their surroundings. This test is conducted by assessing which region can be differentiated from their surroundings or an adjacent density by the viewer. There can be some subjectivity to resolving between different densities on a screen because there are many factors at play, including the lighting conditions and the visual acuity of the viewer. So this test is conducted with comparison to a baseline level under set conditions, which have to be repeated each time the test is conducted. Contrast resolution should be tested quarterly. Finally, the patient dose should be measured to assess whether the CT dose index displayed by the scanner is an accurate assessment of the dose being delivered to the patient some level of variability from the true dose is acceptable, but the primary purpose of the displayed CTDI and DLP for each scan is to compare to as reference levels to compare to other scans performed on that same scanner. As we know, dosimetry is a complex science and it's not always easy to get a true idea of the dose delivered to a patient based solely on the CTDI indicated by the scanner. However, testing this regularly is a good way to ensure that the CTDI displayed is at least somewhat of an accurate representation of what the patient actually received. This should be tested semi-annually by a medical physicist using both a body and head sized phantom. We'll finish with a quick fire round of a few artifacts you may see in CT images. Beam hardening artifact is the result of a disproportionate amount of X-ray photons being absorbed by a dense structure within the patient, for example, a metal implant, or the thick bones of the petrous ridges. The result is a streaking or a star pattern with both dark and bright areas. The dark areas are the result of the beam having a higher average energy when passing through in that direction because the low energy photons have all been attenuated by the dense structure. And the bright areas are the result of some of that very high amount of attenuation being misattributed to nearby areas along the same projection pathway. If you want a simple answer as to why this happens, it's basically because we are scanning very dense structures which are beyond the optimal range of the scanner's capabilities. This artifact can be decreased by using a beam with a higher average energy, either through increasing the KV or using filtration. And using iterative reconstruction or artifact reduction software can also be very effective. Next up, we have a partial volume artifact. And this occurs when you have two structures of very different densities next to each other occupying the same voxel on a thick slice. If you have both black and white occupying the same voxel, you will end up with an averaged gray, but that gray is not an accurate representation of what's actually happening in that voxel, right? We're, we have black and white, but we're seeing gray. The solution to this is to use thinner slices so that there's less volume being averaged within each slice. Perhaps the easiest artifact to identify is motion, and this appears simply as a blur or possibly as the same structure appearing in different positions between slices. Uh, the most common example will be motion in the chest due to the patient breathing, so the solution is to have the patient hold their breath. If you're working in pediatrics, you may need to be more creative with the methods to reduce motion, for example, using distraction techniques, restraints, or in some cases, anesthesia. Finally, you may see a ring artifact which looks like ripples on a pond. This is caused by a detector issue and can sometimes be fixed by redoing your calibrations. However, sometimes this type of artifact will require the attention of a service engineer. As always, thanks for watching and keep up the hard work.